that we're kicking off this uh, development dialogue series in 2022 with a talk from a colleague, uh, Coralie. Um, just as a bit of background, um, I worked with Coralie um, indirectly a couple of years ago because a, a PhD student of mine, um, Jessica Spaker, was at the uh, Stockholm Resilience Centre. And she was looking at questions of climate change um, and the impact on fisheries conflict. So it was a very complex and interesting um, study, but it was also very difficult to um, explain that to an audience. Um, talking with Jessica, she thought it would be a really good idea to try to improve the uh, communication of her research. And a way to do that was to think of um, introducing her papers through uh, animations, which would essentially capture the core message that she was trying to uh, say in the paper itself. So we, we talked about that and it seemed like a good idea. And um, she worked with Coralie, who she knew uh, previously. And uh, the product, I think you'll see later on, was really excellent. And uh, I was really happy uh, to see this as a, as a kind of touch point for people that maybe don't know very much about the subject or are interested in the topic, but would find, you know, reading a hard academic paper a bit, um, a bit uh, difficult to do. Um, so then when we were doing our own project here at SEI, uh, I was leading on a project called Locacoms, which was looking at conflict prevention and low carbon development. Um, and basically we had planned to do a series of dissemination activities in Kenya and Ethiopia, as well as in Stockholm. But of course, as we all know, COVID had other plans and that really made it difficult to communicate the outcomes of the project we were working on. Um, and we were sort of going around the houses a bit amongst the team about thinking of options to disseminate our work. And then I thought, ah, well, what about we contact Coralie um, and maybe she could produce some animation similar to what she did with Jessica at SRC uh, to, to create some animations to describe the narrative of, of what we were trying to say. So for about six months or so now, Coralie, Coralie and I have been working uh, in our team and we're, we've produced a series of these animations which essentially communicate the core messages of the various outputs from our project. And um, it's been a real pleasure and a really interesting experience to work with a professional who uh, really knows what they're doing but doesn't know much about our subject. And that interaction has been, you know, really enjoyable. Uh, and it's great um, to get somebody who is, you know, pushing back at you and interrogating you and saying, yep, yep, that's great. Lots of lovely words, but what are you trying to tell me here? And who are you trying to tell it to? Uh, so it's been really a, a, a positive experience for me and, and I've really enjoyed working with uh, Coralie over the last few months. Um, so I will pass the mic over to Coralie and then she can tell a little bit more about what she's been doing uh, on this project and some other work she's done before as well. Over to you. Yes, thank you, Matthew. I will start by sharing my screen. You will see my presentation. Oh, let me, I think I need to include music as well. All right, if everything works well, you will see my presentation now. So, hi everybody. My name is Coralie Legrand and I am motion designer and visual storyteller from Brussels, Belgium. And I'd like to start by thanking SEI and in particular Matthew Osborne and the team behind Sweet Have Talks for inviting me today to talk to you about visual communication and storytelling and how it can help you to create more impact with your research. I'll start off by giving you a short introduction on me and my work. After that, I'll be talking a little bit about storytelling. So what is it and why is it so important? Next, I'll be taking you through all of the different steps of creating an animated explainer video, and I'll do this through different projects that I've created. And lastly, I'll give you some key takeaways and we will have a Q&A after that. So, Let's start with a short introduction. As a professional, I can go by many names. I'm a motion designer, I'm a graphic designer, I'm an illustrator, I'm also an animator, I'm a social entrepreneur, but in general, I am a visual storyteller. So through storytelling, I design and create still or animated content 
that helps deliver a message to raise awareness, to inform or to educate a certain audience. And I've been designing for more than 10 years and I've added animation to my tool belt around uh, four years ago. And after a career in fast fashion, I realized I really wanted to use my skills to help raise awareness around sustainability and to focus on science communication and social impact. Because I want to help create change to move towards a better future and to tackle the climate crisis. So scientific research plays a very important role in our society, but often it stays inside of the academic world. And my mission is to really create visual communication tools that help bridge that gap between the scientific community and the rest of the world. And I do this by making the complex science more digestible. So my challenge is really to translate the complexity behind it and to make it more understandable and engaging as a tool to create societal impact. And this is something I'm super passionate about because I think that there is tremendous opportunity for visual communication and storytelling here. So what does my work look like? This is a, a short selection or small selection, and it can be really anything from uh, a still illustration to an animated GIF, uh, a full explainer video, social media posts, but also infographics, publications or presentations. So now that you know what I do, I would like to tell you a little bit more about storytelling. So what is storytelling? Well, storytelling is the vivid description of ideas, beliefs, personal experiences or lessons through stories or narratives that evoke powerful emotions and insights. And what is visual storytelling? Visual storytelling is a story that's primarily told through the use of visual media. So the story can be told using photography or illustration, video. It can be enhanced with graphics or different types of audio, such as voiceover or music. But why is it so important and valuable? So this is the Sulawesi cave in Indonesia, and this might actually be the world's oldest recorded story. And in his TED talk, The Science of Storytelling, uh, author and journalist Will Storr says that stories come as natural to our brain as breathing is to our mouth. It's really a product of our biological evolution. And the brain loves stories. It's how we bond, it's how we learn, and it's how we share. And it has been deeply connected to our humanity from the very start. So about 100,000 years ago, humans started developing language. And it is believed that we started using storytelling to transfer knowledge from generation to generation, to educate each other, to warn each other. And later on, people started using visual stories through cave paintings. And it's only quite recent that we started transferring knowledge through text. And stories actually create an emotional investment. So when we listen to a story, our entire brain starts to light up. Each of your lobes will light up as your senses and your emotions are being engaged. Stories actually give, give us this artificial reality. It connects us to the message on a very human level and it makes it more likely for, for the viewer to remember and engage with the content. Neuroscientists have also studied decision-making and they discovered it all starts in the amygdala. And this is our emotional epicenter where we um, have the ability to experience emotions. And it's actually here on a subconscious level that the decision-making process starts happening. And at the point where we become more aware of it, on a, conscious on a conscious level, we start applying rationalization and logic to it, which is why we think that we're making these very rational decisions, while in reality, the process already started happening in our subconscious. And the thing is that the commercial world understands this very well. And this is why marketing is such a serious business and billions of dollars are being spent every year by businesses um, to connect to their customers, to sell their services and their products. So to give you an idea, uh, Coca-Cola spends an average of 4 billion US dollars a year on advertising alone. And in 2020, Amazon spent a whopping 22 billion US dollars on marketing. 
Now, in the last two years, the data has been heavily influenced by the pandemic, of course, which is uh, what we can see here on the left. Uh, this shows the percentage of revenue that was allocated to marketing over the last two years per industry. But even with that dip, there is still so much money being spent on marketing and communication. And this is exactly why I'm so passionate about this, because I believe that these are tools that we could and should use for the better to help society create a more sustainable future especially now in a world where the climate crisis where we're facing the biggest climate crisis um, in the history of humanity and there's a big urgency to act and these methods of visual storytelling have been tested and approved by the commercial world so we know that they work so imagine how much impact science and research could make by using visual communication and storytelling together with the research and the data. Because it's not an either or situation, it's an end situation. Storytelling and research together actually create this power ballot that really connects you to the information differently on an, into that emotional way that we all make decisions. And I think that there is a lot of untapped potential there. But it's not an easy task. Because in today's uh, communication field, there are two opposing forces at work. On one hand, we have the content overload. There is so much content being released every day that people often suffer from digital fatigue. And on the other hand, we have fragmented user attention spans. And those two together make it quite challenging to really stand out for a crowd when you're communicating something. But that's why it's so important to really make a difference and really connect to the viewer on an emotional level. And that's what visual storytelling can do. It gives us a way to uh, open up to a whole new world of possibilities, uh, new ways to convey the message and to share it. So, that's all about storytelling. But how do we build those visual stories? Well, that's my job. And it is something that I'm very excited about. So let me tell you how that works. For the purpose of this talk, I'll be talking about the process of creating an animated explainer video. Uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, there are different types of uh, visual communication tools, um, but most of them include the steps that I'll be talking about today. Some of them have less steps, some of them have more, but in general, uh, this is what the essence, uh, what the process looks like. I'll be talking about all of the different steps that you see on this chart here, and we'll go through them one by one. So, first things first. Every great project starts with a clear briefing. Sometimes clients come to me and they know exactly what they want. They have all the information bundled up, they know what they want, they know what they need, and that's amazing. But sometimes they don't, and that's also fine, because then we can create the brief together. The most important thing to know before you start on creating a communication tool is to know your goal. What is the purpose? What is it that you want to achieve with this communication tool? What is the desired outcome? So, for example, do you want to trigger people with the video um, to afterwards read the full research paper? Or do you want to take out a particularly complex part of the research and really explain that? So knowing where you want to go is half of the work. After that, there are two important secondary questions to be answered. And the first one is, what are we trying to communicate? So what is the core message that we're trying to get across? And narrowing this down into one or a few sentences really helps to set a target for the video. The second secondary question to be answered is, who are we talking to? So who is the audience that we're trying to reach? And this is very important because in order to create a captivating tool that really connects to the viewer, we have to know who they are and we have to know what their background is. So, for example, if we're trying to reach scientists or practitioners in a specific field, we might be able to assume that they already have some prior knowledge on the subject. But on the other hand, if we're trying to reach a general public who might not have an academic background, 
we need to adjust our language and the way we're getting the message across. So once these three main questions are answered, we can move on to the next stage. And that is the script. The script is really the base for the entire video. This is a highly collaborative stage uh, where we set a solid foundation for an engaging story that effectively conveys the core message. And when I work with research and science, this is a challenging task because we're trying to simplify um, the research into a cohesive and understandable narrative that still does justice to the depth of the science. And when it comes to an animated video, more words mean more time and also more work. So to give you an idea, a two minute video should not have more than 300 to 350 words. And in comparison to a research paper, as you all know, that is not a whole lot. And time is an important aspect to take into the equation because of that dynamic that I talked about with the content overload on one hand and the fragmented attention spans on the other. And that's why we don't want the video to be too long. But in reality, that often makes me the word police because I've noticed that researchers really love words, which makes sense. Research is something that you do with a group of people over a long period of time, you go very much into depth. But how do we translate that lengthy research project into a short two minute video? And that is exactly why building a script together is such a collaborative stage or needs collaboration. Because I need you to tell me what is scientifically correct and relevant. You are a specialist in your field. And then it's my job to create a captivating story out of, that, out of that, using as few words as possible. So those first meetings are very vital and in my opinion shouldn't be rushed. So once we have our script, I move on to the concept phase where I sketch out all of the storyboards to show how the script would be visualized scene by scene. Now, these are very much sketches. They are rough and they're a little bit ugly, but the goal is to start building the visual story and to not get lost in details, details just yet. The ones I show here are very rough. I usually don't show the client these, um, but I make clean sketches afterwards uh, to send and talk about. So after I've sketched out the full story and we've agreed on the storyline, I move on to art direction. And art direction is really all about style. It's about colors, textures, it basically the look of the video. And I explore different styles through mood boards. And for this project that I'm co-creating with SEI and Matthew, we are looking at low carbon development in Africa and we're trying to explain the technique of flood recession farming, which is a technique that is being used in, for instance, the Omo Valley in Ethiopia. And we want to explain why it is so important, but also what happens when big dams are being built for renewable energy supply and how that disrupts the flood. And in this project, it was very important that we connected the viewer to the people's lives that, got, that were interrupted by the dams. And we were very lucky in this project because we had film footage available from Ethiopia and uh, this seemed like a great opportunity to use that to connect to the viewer, to connect the viewer to the actual people involved. Because when we're depicting people in design or animation, it's always very important that we also think about representation, diversion, uh, diversity and inclusion. And in this project, it seemed best to go with the actual footage over illustrations or designs. I chose to use uh, simple but soft lines, like you can see here in the middle, um, with a, quite a hand-drawn look to really have that natural feeling to the design. In this stage, I also think about textures and other details. And I build all of that together until I have a visual style that works best for the project. And then we have color. Color is a really important part of visual storytelling 
because it's again one of those sensory aspects that really tap into our emotions. And for this project, I really wanted to ground the design into reality. Uh, so I opted for a rather realistic color palette using browns and greens and those organic textures um, to talk about nature as a way to connect it back to the region in particular. And so after all of that, it's time for design. And I take the sketched out design uh, storyboards and I transform them into full blown designs. And I use all of the elements of the art direction to do that. These are some designs I created for uh, the future of fisheries, a project I co-created with the SRC and Jessica Spekers, and that Matthew also mentioned in the introduction. And here are some of the designs for the current project I'm creating um, with SEI on the video for, for the video about flood recession farming. And so one of the reasons that visual storytelling and in particular animation is so powerful for layered topics is the ability to break down complexity into something that's easily understood by the viewer. Because in design and animation, we're not bound by rules of reality. We can choose how we visualize something. And that really gives us a lot of opportunities. Metaphors are actually, or visual metaphors, are actually very powerful tools to simplify complex topics into a way, in a way that really engages the viewer and is easily understood. So for example, in this project um, that I, the future of fisheries, we were breaking down the complexity of different socioeconomic and ecological factors that come into play when we talk about conflict around fisheries. They all affect each other, they intersect, they create a very complex and layered situation and we needed a way to simplify that. And so in this project or in this scene, I chose to work with um, quite a simple setup with different kind of circles that represent those factors that then fall into the sea, uh, disrupting the currents and stirring conflict at sea. So this is actually a great example on how um, metaphors and visual metaphors can really um, help to explain a complex topic. So <clears throat> once I have all of the designs, I move on to animation. And that's truly where the story comes to life. Animation is a rather technical and very time consuming process. Um, so I make sure that all of the design choices are locked before we move into this stage. Here you see uh, some clips for the future of fisheries. And you will see more on this project in the end of this presentation as well. And on this slide, you have a, um, flu two clips from the, uh, the video I'm creating for flood recession farming with SEI. Uh, this is still work in progress, but I wanted to show you anyway. And then when all of that is done, we have one final thing to do, and that is to work with the audio. We have to pick the right voice for our narrator that's going to tell our story, and we have to pick music or a soundtrack that really helps set the mood for the video. And audio, again, is one of those sensory aspects that really help the viewer to get into the right mood or emotion for the video. And for example, if you think about it, a horror movie would not be half as scary if you took the music away. And after that, the video is ready to be used, whether it's to put on a website or to uh, screen in a meeting, uh, to post on social media, wherever you see it fit. And that's it. That's how we create these animated uh, videos. And so to end, I'd like to show you uh, a fully animated video and I would have loved to show you the two projects that we're creating with SEI, but since they're not quite finished yet, um, I decided to show you the future of fisheries instead. The world is changing, and so is the ocean. Due to multiple stressors, such as climate change, overfishing, and poor resource management, the ocean suffers a great deal, as do the living species within it. 
One of the consequences of these unprecedented changes is growing tension over fisheries. Expert data shows that a multitude of stressors is responsible for sparking conflict at sea, rising nationalism, overfishing, climate change, and inadequate fishery regulations are just a few of those stressors. In some regions, a number of these stressors have already risen to the surface and are already causing ripple effects. Whether they act on a local or global scale, these drivers can further influence each other, making this a complex and layered problem. The ocean's fishery resources play a major part in our food supply. When fish populations become threatened, our global food security will be challenged. If we don't act now, the conflicts that may emerge might put not only fish stocks, but also people at risk. The decisions we make today can lead to a dramatically different tomorrow. Now is the time to reduce risk and safety. Whether you're a policymaker, a concerned scientist, or an engaged citizen, we need all hands on deck. Because only by standing together can we protect our fisheries and avoid conflict at sea. The ocean needs you, because if she is at risk, we are at risk. <coughs> so that is what an output could look like. Uh, and what is the impact of a visual tool or what can you expect when you work with visual communication? And so for this project that I um, created with uh, Jessica for the future of fisheries, the research got picked up by Stanford University and uh, the marine biologists and they both used the visuals that we created um, in the articles. Uh, we created four animated illustrations, which is what you see here in the articles. Uh, on top of or next to the video. And Jessica speak speakers believed that the visuals really uh, helped to extend the reach and the impact of the research. And that is really what it's all about, um, to make sure that the right people learn about the research and then use it to create that societal change. So to end, I would like to give you five takeaways. The first one is visual storytelling is almost as old as humanity, meaning that it is very entangled with our biological evolution. And the combination of research and storytelling is particularly powerful for sustainability science in a world where, uh, where societal impact is more pertinent than ever due to the climate crisis. And you, we need all the tools we can get. And this, this is a method that's been tested and approved many times over by the commercial world, and we know that it works. It is a very powerful tool that help, helps you to connect the viewer on a more emotional level, uh, which is where we know that our decision making starts happening. And that is especially important to not get lost in the quicksand of online content these days where everybody is fighting for people's attention. And then lastly, if you want to create a, um, a visual communication tool, there are three core questions that you need to think about. What is the goal that you're trying to achieve? What is the core message that you're trying to communicate? And who is the audience? And when you answer those three, you really set yourself up for creating a powerful visual communication tool. I have listed some extra resources um, in case you want to learn a bit more about these topics. And if you want to reach out with any questions or um, yeah, comments, feel free to do so. And then all that rests me is to thank you for your attention and, and for taking the time of your, out of your day to listen to me. And we can move on to the Q&A. Thank you very much, Coralie. If I could, um, I can hear the room clapping you in the background, but that was really, really great to hear. <laughs> um, 
I, I was struck as you were talking um, about the benefits of leveraging uh, the experience of the uh, private sector for our collective public good. And I was like, that's such a smart thing to do. You know, if people have invested, you know, money and time to, to learn these techniques uh, to sell us stuff. So why not, you know, re-divert those skills um, uh, for like our, our shared benefit. I think that's really a great idea. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are um, plenty of questions, so I'll dig into them straight away. Um, I will leave my colleagues to tell me when time is up, but uh, I'll just plow ahead with the first question I have. Um, this one's from George and it's, uh, can every type of research be visualized, he asks. Well, of course, it really depends on the topic as well, but I think um, we in every research we can find a way to communicate um, the, the message and it all depends on, on what, um, what the different tools that you pick. I mean, it could be a presentation that, I mean, if it's a more um, abstract topic, maybe a presentation that's really uses some uh, smart infographics or some visuals can really help there. Um, if we're talking about um, a, like more sustainability or something that's really grounded in reality, an animated figure could be very useful. So it all starts with the goal and it all starts with um, what are we trying to communicate? And then we have to find the right tool uh, to do that. So I think, yes, I think most research um, would definitely benefit from it. Of course, there are some like very technical mathematical things that might be more challenging. Um, but I think in if you're trying to communicate something, it's always great to think about this because humans, we think in, in images and, and it really connects to us. So what, what, it, what it is that you're communicating um, doesn't really matter, I think. Fantastic. Um... The next one is a, a, a comment and a question, really. So the, it's from uh, Kalika, who says uh, such beautiful visual metaphors and then asks, can you share your process for coming up with the concepts for them? I, so, yeah. Thank you, Kalika. Um, so coming up with the concepts. Yeah, that's I mean, that's a very, very big question. And it's kind of like the creative sauce <laughs> that comes out of my head. Um, but what I do I is in the beginning of every project is that I ask for a lot of uh, reading material first. So that's also when we're talking about the script and we're building that so that I really get um, um, almost, I take a deep dive into the world that I'm trying to communicate. And then uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big question about how creativity kind of happens. Um, for me, it's very um, basic things. It's, it's, you know, having the research or having the um, the thing I'm trying to the core message in my head, and then I see things, I, I see, see things, I associate things. Um, there's so much inspiration everywhere. So um, yeah, I look at a lot of different things. I will also have a look at what has been done, um, how things have been uh, visualized, and then yeah, and then I come back to my to my um, drawing table and and kind of puzzle that together creatively but it's I mean it's not like I have one moment and I sit down and everything comes it's really like uh, a puzzle that I'm making and things yeah it's it's a process I hope that answers your question Kalika um, uh, we have one from Victoria which is um, how similar or different is creating content for policymakers versus the general public yeah, so um, that's a great question because that's again ties back into those four questions and I think it's it's quite different in the way that I mean we have to um, know who we're talking to in order to really be able to connect to them. I think if we're talking to practitioners uh, who are for example working in the renewable energy space there are, there's language and wording that we can use um, that we know that they already are aware of. And if we're talking to the general public, we might need to connect more on that. I mean, we have to do it on both, but more on that human level, uh, connected back to their lives. And and it's it's a lot about the language. I think it's a lot about how we, uh, how far can we uh, use scientific terms, um, and how much do we have to explain them as well? If we're talking about a concept, maybe practitioners would be more. Um, yeah, we can.
it takes some more uh, liberation there. Um, but it depends on what field and honestly also uh, what message. For sure, yeah. Um, excellent. excellent. Uh, we have quite a practical question here, I think, from Alessandro. So he's saying that as a project manager, <clears throat> if uh, if he's interested in, in exploring the use of illustrated animations to spread knowledge about his project, how can he reach a motion designer such as yourself and how much budget should he allocate for this task? I don't yeah, know. <laughs> great question. Um, so how to reach me is, uh, or how to reach uh, visual storytellers in general is, I mean, there's, there's uh, plenty of us out there, so I would say emailing or uh, it would be a great way to start or doing a Google search or something like that. Um, but then when we're talking about budget, that's, that's a very good question because um, every project is unique. So it's very hard to say, OK, an explainer video costs this exact amount of money. But in general, um, I, I give clients a range of like, let's say the video that you just saw, the future of fisheries, that could go anywhere in between 6,000 and 15 or 14,000 uh, euros. So it really, it depends on the complexity of the research. It depends on <clears throat> the length of the video, the complexity of the style, um, how, yeah. and. Animation is so time consuming that often, and this is a bit sad for us, but often the budget kind of defines how complex and how um, long we can work on something. The longer we work on something, the better it is, obviously. Um, but that's also, I mean, I don't want to discourage anybody with those, with that. I think uh, what I often tell my clients as well is that we can also have a look at the budget available and then see how can we achieve the outputs in the smartest way possible or what can, what can we do with the budget and how can we allocate it in a way um, that reaches your goals. Um, but when we're talking, for instance, about still designs, um, it could start, F, yeah, I mean, there's such a big range, uh, but it, it can start somewhere between five to six hundred euros for an illustration up to, yeah, uh, I, I, very difficult to say three, four thousand. I mean, it really, really depends on the project itself. But uh, feel, I mean, I think having an open question about that budget um, is you can definitely do that. You don't have to assume to know or, or I mean, it's yeah, it's a conversation to have is what I'm trying to say. I hope that answers your question. Yes, that's a conversation we have had you know, before as well, probably. And and it is, it's a discussion, isn't it? You have to sort of see uh, what you're trying to do and, and the length of time you have to do it. We have a, a question from uh, Johanna, um, which is, it's a little bit lengthy. When it comes to working with metaphors, how to find uh, a good balance between cliches uh, that, are, uh, that are easy to understand and then creating some new symbols uh, or to represent some more broad topics that might be more difficult to understand. So I guess it's how to sort of simplify but without it becoming a meaningless cliche. Perhaps. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's really, um, I mean, that's really my job. Um, when we're trying to build a story, sometimes it's it's easy to fall into these cliches or to go like very sensational and to use words or you know sentences that sound very big. Um, and I think. And I, I, I try to, when I work with research and science, to, to not go overly dramatic. And um, it's something that we see in the commercial world where, you know, it's, it's drama and, and big things are always very, very good. But I think we're talking about a very uh, serious thing when we're talking about science and data and research. Um, so I think we, it's important to take that down a bit and to not focus on that dramatic um, storytelling so much. Um, and when it comes to, to metaphors, I think um, there's definitely, we always have to keep in mind who the audience is. Um, metaphors and, and some things that are cliche, for instance, for us, might not be cliche or easily understood by people in different parts of the world, different cultures. So it's also about that and, and finding this universal language uh, to communicate something. Um, but I mean, cliches are not necessarily always a bad thing. I think if, if we find things that people in, within this universal thing of, that we understand, um, that can also be a tool. And it's something that we can also use to, to help them connect 
Um, so that's again this finding this balance uh, for me in the in that creative process. Yeah. Great. Um, I have a, a question from Nelson, which is, um, can you share any concrete examples of how you have engaged with the public in communicating the outcome of research that was done in their community? That might be a bit specific, but. Um, yeah, I think, and maybe also, I mean, because I created tools that I then hand over to the researchers who would take it further into the field. So I'm not sure. Um, I, I can only, like what I mentioned with uh, what Jessica talked talk to me about, how she had a feeling that, or she thought that the research was really picked up or had a further reach because of the visuals. Um, and I, I mean, I think if, if, I that's that's where my knowledge I'm not an academia so I I know from the world through talking to you and through talking to my clients and and, and stuff like that but I it's not my world uh, so in that sense I'm not sure I can answer it fully I mean I I can answer a little bit for you maybe because um the reason we wanted to connect with you um, for, for our animation is that we couldn't go to the places where we were working in order to talk about the outcomes of our of our work. So we needed to find a medium that could essentially explain what we had learned to the people who had taught us mm -hmm. directly, um, but doing that in a way that was tangible and accessible. So this seemed like a really good opportunity. So I'll report back to you how successful it's been mm -hmm. when, we're, when we're done. Yeah. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, a sorry. little bit. Yeah, that's because I mean, the video that we're trying to, or the video that we're creating around flood recession farming, the idea is there as well. So it's it's a, quite an objective video that talks about explaining a certain technique, but the idea really for the video is that it can live onwards and that it can really live um, in that field of renewable space or pr practitioners in that space. So that when they um, are, building a new project around it or, or thinking about building new dams or uh, working in that space they can connect back to that video and i think having the short two minute video we have a much more bigger chance that they will look at that and that that will spread itself rather than a full research paper that they have to read prior to to um, starting with that so i think it's also this way of how videos Find our, they find their ways into our society very easily and they're very easily distributed and it takes it takes two minutes of our time uh, which is a pretty small time commitment that people have to make um, and if we can in that sense uh, give the core message or deliver the core message and I think we're very successful. Um, I, I, I'm going to ask just two more questions. One is sort of a, a question which relates to what you just described, really. I think you may have just answered it, but it's from Victoria saying, going more into the differences between engaging policymakers versus the public, do you think that more emotive style of animation with its simpler messaging will influence a policymaker who also has access to the more detailed and technical messaging? I guess it's a Sorry, question could about... Could you repeat? <clears throat> yeah, I, I think it's a question of... Um, uh, the difference between uh, engaging policymakers versus the public on the one hand and the idea of emotive style of animation with its simpler messaging. Will this influence policymakers who also have access to the sort of technical reports and so on and so forth? Does it fulfill the same? Um, well, means? yeah, so this this goes really back to the goal of the of the, of the visual communication tool in the first place. Um, what I find is that often when we're trying to reach the general public, it's more on a level of creating awareness around something. Um, so it's it's yeah, it's more in that space. When we're talking to practitioners or policymakers, um, often it feels like we are trying to, um, I mean, and this comes back, I think, in many parts of sustainability science, the, it's about talking about the complexity of the situation, about the different layers coming together, um, and and it's more tangible uh, message that, that I think we're trying to get across about about a specific topic. Um, and I would, I mean, I can see it's it seems pretty similar, but then I think it's um, it's how we go about the language and it's how how I what were we visualizing? Um, so. Yeah, there is definitely a difference, but it's it's easy to talk about it in a vacuum, but we have to look at the goal and then um, we have to look at who we're talking to and that really, yeah, 
so it's it's different for every project. But I would say in general, the general public is more about awareness, and uh, we can dive a little bit deeper when it is when we're talking to practitioners. Or well, that's at least my experience up so far. I'm going to squeeze a couple more in here. Um, there are two two um, questions that are sort of a bit more technical, perhaps. So one is from uh, Kalika, who's saying, what is the typical timeline from creative brief to delivery of a video like the one you showed? So that's the first question. And then uh, the, the second one is from Steve, which is, are stories and visuals culturally independent? Or do you need to think about the differences with the location of your audience? So yeah, two great questions. Uh, I'll start with the timeline. Um, yeah, so the timeline, there's different ways we can go about this. Uh, sometimes there's a hard deadline from the client and then we really work towards that. Um, then, I mean, we, you know, we try to, if it is a very short deadline, we try to crunch in the time. Um, but I think in general, um, having a few, at least a few months is also really good to to um, have time to really dive into it and to really be clear on what we're communicating and to building that script. Um, when I have projects in the more commercial world, it usually there's a quick turnaround, um, but it's 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 way less complex in a way. And I think, like I mentioned before, I think those first meetings are extremely important. And I really find that we have uh, we can create better outputs of and more qualitative outputs if all of us have time to really digest and to for me to dive into the research for us to have these conversations uh, about what it is that we should communicate and then yeah really taking the time to build it so i would say at least a minimum would be two months minimum absolute minimum but ideally, I mean, we've been working, yeah, and, and you, Matthew, can can um, um, testify on that. I mean, we we set a short deadline in the beginning, and then when it felt like we needed more time anyway. So, yeah, um, there are a couple of months for sure, um, and I would say five to six months would be ideal, or four to five. Um, yeah, so that's the first one. And then, yeah, st our stories, location or cultural bound, absolutely. I think um, that's... That's really something to take in mind. We cannot assume, and that's, I mean, we shouldn't assume that our stories um, are easily understood or carry the same um, emotional connection that to other parts in the world. So that's the first openness that we have to have there. Um, and really, that's why I think it is so vital to understand who that audience is, because it's so easy to stay in your bubble of, um, you know, I'm making something pretty and I think it's amazing and I connect to it. But yeah, I mean, if I'm not the person we're trying to reach, then what are we doing? We're just creating uh, something nice in a vacuum. So understanding um, who the audience is, uh, cultural backgrounds, um, also being aware of symbols or colors or different kind of um, associations in different cultures, uh, I think is very important. And also I think it's, Part of it's. I mean, it's it's in my. I think as a communicator, it's it's vital <laughs> that I think about these things. So yeah, that's fantastic. Um, uh, well, we don't have any more time for questions. There are several still coming, but um, I'm sure we could keep talking like this for a lot longer. But I want to just thank you personally very much for agreeing to come and talk to us today. Um, and I've really enjoyed our collaboration so far, and I'm looking forward to continuing. And um, and yeah, thanks very much. I'll pass over to Janet now. Thanks a lot, uh, Matthew, and uh, thanks a lot, Coralie, really, for your great uh, presentation. And uh, sorry for everyone, maybe it only happened in my computer, but I was in the beginning, I was hearing it three times in my own voice and I just couldn't uh, continue talking. So, uh, but uh, I'll say the words I was aiming to say in the beginning about these dialogues uh, now instead. So um, these dialogues were created by it's the development and aid policy team at the SCI headquarters and SWED, the Swedish Development Researchers Network, and we aim to continue with this uh, dialogue. So this was the second one in our series. But just shortly on uh, what the development and aid policy team is and also what SWEDEV is that uh, the DAP team, we were formed uh, as part of a reorganization uh, at SCI in September 2022. 
and uh, uh, the formation of a team, a specific team at SCI working with development and aid was a response to an internal project looking at the development dimensions of SCI's work. Uh, and uh, so despite that SCI is conducting a lot of work within the development field uh, and has a dual mandate, which is development and environment, it is mainly recognized as an, as an environment think tank. Uh, so the DAP team uh, wants to bring forward the development work uh, done by uh, SCI and uh, works with issues related to human development and environment from local to global scale. And then Swedev, uh, it's a member-based network. It was constituted in November 2019. We have around 1,000 um, subscribers to our newsletter and around 200 members uh, at the moment. Uh, the network aims to connect the researchers, development researchers, and uh, uh, the research um, and to increase the interaction between development researchers and practitioners. And uh, please check out more about the network on our website, swedev.dev. And, and on the website, you can also register yourself as a member if you are a researchers, uh, researcher or sign up to our newsletter. And uh, when signing up to the newsletter, you will know about uh, our future dialogues uh, as well when uh, we invite more speakers to these dialogues. Um, yeah, so this uh, opportunity that we already now now have had is uh, it uh, the aim of this is to have uh, uh, be a learning space where we spread findings of development research um, and uh, uh, we aim to invite uh, development researchers around the world uh, to give short presentations about ongoing uh, or finalized uh, work uh, and we're targeting researchers, practitioners and policymakers. Um, so uh, if you do have any ideas of uh, like speakers you think we should invite to our future events, please be in touch with us uh, or uh, as said earlier, if you want to receive uh, invitations to the forthcoming events, uh, please sign up to uh, this web dev uh, newsletter. And uh, yeah, by these words, I think uh, I want to thank you, Coralie, so much for this uh, talk and Matthew for uh, moderating it. And thank you all of the participants uh, uh, for uh, participating in this event and hope to see you in our next event in maybe one or two months time. Thanks a lot.